Welcome back to New Rockstars, I'm Eric Voss, and this is a breakdown of Blue Beetle. This DC superhero film starring Zola Maraduena as Jaime Reyes was so much fun, and I'm gonna break down some details and Easter eggs you might have missed. The film opens on a snowy dig site as Lieutenant Ignacio Carapax, Raul Max Trujillo, locates the Scarab artifact. Carapax in the comics is the indestructible man, but this movie combines that with another DC villain, Omac. He's greeted by Victoria Cord, Susan Sarandon, and her vehicle is lit with a purple glow, as everything with Cord Industries in this film has a purple color tone. Now Victoria Accord mentions Prometheum, which is a super powerful metal alloy that's kind of like the DCU's vibranium. It was used to make weapons and armor for Deathstroke, played by Joe Manganiello in the Justice League theatrical cut post credit scene, and voiced by Will Arnett in Teen Titans Go to the Movies. Now in the opening credits, we see the Scarab flying through space and we see a flash of green light knocking it off course. The director has confirmed that this is intended to be from a Green Lantern. We don't know which one yet, but one of the Green Lanterns. Now this opening credits montage mentions a headline with the name Dan Garrett. That was the name of the first first Blue Beetle when the character began under Fox Comics and then Charlton Comics before it was acquired by DC Comics. And at this point, the Blue Beetle title had moved on to Ted Cord. Ted's sister, Victoria Cord, is actually a recent comics introduction in Blue Beetle Graduation Day number two, which came out in February of this year. This is also the issue that introduced Palmera City as a setting in the DC Comics, where, as in this movie, the family lives on El Paso Street, as the city of El Paso also is an important influence on Palmera City. We see in the opening credits montage a headline, Garrett receives research funding from Ted Cord, linking all the generations of Blue Beetle to this one shared history. We see a Daily Planet newspaper reporting, new hero in Palmyra City, vigilante Blue Beetle saves city from Fire Fist. Fire Fist, Lyle Burns, was a Blue Beetle villain from the 1980s. In this opening montage, we also see the Ted Cord Blue Beetle costume, though we do not see his face because no actor has been credited in the role yet. Though someone must have played that voice in the post credit scene. We just don't know who yet. Jaime's plane lands at Palmyra City, home of the Blue Beetle. This idea of a tropical city with an urban center right on the beach, recalling Miami, Florida. And I like how the underside of this plane has two spots that look like the pattern on a beetle exoskeleton. Jaime has returned from Gotham City, where he is a pre-law student, and that could explain his black graduation cap with a yellow tassel, because black and yellow are commonly known as Gotham's colors. On the escalator, he passes a sign boasting, number one lowest tax rate for corporations in America? Yes, the city's being industrialized and urbanized, making it hard for families like the Reyes's to keep living there. We see a Starbucks replacing a carniceria. We see signs for the new cord buildings going up in the edge keys. I'm just surprised that the edge keys lasted this long. There's also a grocery store named Soto after the director of this movie, Angel Manuel Soto. Uncle Rudy, by the way, has a Cheech and Chong bobbleheads on the dashboard, and later we get a close-up of one of them during the action scene. Super fun. Now, while the Cord Industries is coated purple, the Reyes family home, their walls, the rooftop, and soon, Jaime's armor are all color-coded the same shade of blue. Jaime and his sister look out from the keys to downtown Palmyra City, where you can see an Ace Chemical sign. That, of course, is the open vatted chemical company that deformed the Joker, and a sign that shows up in the background of many of these DCU movies, but the purple cord tower towers over them all in this tale of two cities. But beside this tower we see later is the LexCorp building. They get a gig working on the cleaning crew of the mansion of Victoria Cord, and there's this great shot where it seems like Jaime has achieved his dream of owning a mansion, but then we cut to Milagros to see that they are actually on the clock. But in that wide drone shot of Jaime's imagination, there were no other workers on the ground. So for a brief moment, it was just him alone. Jenny Cord shames Aunt Vicky over the OMAC, the One Man Army Corps, a drone police scene system using exoskeletal symbiotes that latch onto the spinal column. In the DC Comics, OMAC was a Captain America type hero from the early 70s with a Brother Eye satellite that was actually reinvented as an AI hive mind during the 2005-2006 Infinite Crisis event where OMAC went on to stand for Observational Meta-Human Activity Construct and then later Omni-Mind and Community. Jaime's grandmother watches on TV a bunch of shows including one with his golden scarab. This is actually a brief shot from the 1992 indie horror film Kronos written and directed by Guillermo del Toro, his first feature film a horror about a scarab that gives the wearer eternal life, but with consequences. Jaime goes to Cord Industries for an interview and he sees that all the employees wear purple pastel, already feeling out of place. Jenny steals the scarab from Sanchez's office in a Big Belly Burger box. Big Belly Burger being a chain from the DC Comics, technically a subsidiary of LexCorp with a logo that looks like Bob's Big Boy. The scarab latches onto Jamie's face and this whole section is horrifying, filled with famous horror movie homages. The initial latch is like the alien xenomorph facehugger. The exoskeleton bulges out of his back and burns through his sweater and then flies him up the ceiling, just like in John Carpenter's The Thing during the blood test scene. And then Jaime's body initially falls limp, making him look like he's a corpse. The acid covers his hand and burns off his clothes as Jaime screams. It drips off onto the ground. The fluid looks like the discharge some beetles are known to excrete as a defense mechanism. Jaime screams his pain as a sludge covers his head, his eyes, and his nose, even his teeth. Really, I think the creepiest reference point could be from another DC movie, Superman 3. When the supercomputer becomes self-aware and ensnares Vera, transforming her into a cyborg, and she screams as her skin 
is covered in wires and metal plating. In this blue beetle suit, Jaime looks at the framed photo of the Virgin Mary and his beetle eyes reflect over hers, which just feels wrong, but it sets up the scarab having a female voice, this entity, Kajida, voiced by Becky G. A Kajida is later revealed to be the super advanced weapon created by the alien species called the Reach. It first landed on Earth in ancient Egypt and was accidentally imbued with magical powers. That's the story in the comics and we see a bit of that in the opening sequence. Scarab takes Jaime for a test flight. When Jaime's in low orbit, you no longer hear his wing thrusters, only his voice and the Kajida replying to him because there's no external sound in space. Jaime's suit slices through a bus, but doesn't hurt anyone. Jaime freaks out as he puts his clothes back on saying, you can't fly, Superman can fly. Now presumably Blue Beetle is set in the DCEU that this movie was developed to be a part of and his Superman would be Henry Cavill, but we don't see any of the Justice League members in this movie. James Gunn has said that he intends Blue Beetle be part of his future Gods and Monsters slate. Blue Beetle was going to be a Max release though, along with Batgirl, and Batgirl was gonna have Michael Keaton as that universe's Batman, but then The Flash began in the Ben Affleck DCEU, but ended in a George Clooney Batman universe. So this is all very confusing. I'm just gonna default to Blue Beetle being in the DCEU. But to throw a random theory at you, we did learn from the Stinger scene in The Flash that George Clooney's Batman is still out there in the multiverse somewhere. And Batman and Robin had a wild neon version of Gotham, not unlike the skyline of Palmera City. So I don't know, maybe those two movies exist in the same world where neon is a dominant aesthetic. Thank you to BetterHelp for sponsoring this video. Watching stuff frame by frame is great, but it can also be really rewarding to zoom out and look at things like story, pacing, and character development. For a movie, you can just let it play out. But when you're the target of analysis, it's better to get some help from BetterHelp. Regardless if you have a clinical mental health issue like depression or anxiety, or if you're just going through a hard time, therapy can give you some tools to approach your life in a very different way. With BetterHelp, you can tap into a network of over 30,000 licensed and experienced therapists who can help you with a wide range of issues. It's easy to sign up and get matched with a therapist. There's a link in my description. It's betterhelp.com slash new rockstars. To get started, just answer a few questions about what you're looking for from therapy and what your preferences are. BetterHelp will then match you with a therapist from their network that's right for you. If you don't really fit in with that therapist, which is a common thing with therapy, you can easily switch to a therapist for free without stressing about insurance or who's in your network or anything like that. You can always Always benefit from talking to somebody and getting things off your chest. So if you're struggling, consider online therapy with BetterHelp. Click the link in the description or visit betterhelp.com slash do rockstars. Clicking that link helps support this channel, but it also gets you 10% off your first month of BetterHelp. So Jaime's relationship with the Scarab and his family uses the same kind of dynamic as Franz Kafka's Metamorphosis, in which Gregor Samsa wakes up one morning to find himself transformed into a giant insect, hiding himself in shame away from his family in his room and having to come to terms with its new existence. Jaime picks up Jenny, who tells the family about the Scarab's history as an ancient sentient weapon that willingly chose Jaime as its host. At her house party, Victoria offers her military contact a real Cuban cigar, setting up that their secret island fortress is near Cuba. Rudy, Jaime, and Jenny break into Cord Tower. Rudy blocks the security monitors with the stop motion animated series, an homage to El Chapulín Colorado, aka the Red Grasshopper, which was a 70s Spanish language Mexican TV series that parodied superhero shows. Simpsons creator Matt Groening actually said that he created the Bumblebee Man after seeing El Chapulín Colorado in a Mexican motel. So you see, this Simpsons character wasn't a parody of like, absurd absurdist Mexican humor, it was a parody of a parody of how goofy American superhero TV shows had become. So they steal the smartwatch that used to belong to Ted Cord, and they run into Carapax, who has fused his body with the OMAC prototype. Kajida takes the wheel and brings the heat to Carapax, despite Jaime begging not to engage, but stops short of killing Carapax. An important decision. Rudy and Jenny pull the handbrake to take out Carapax with the Chapulín machine, and the three go to Jenny's childhood home, where they use Ted Cord's watch to open his secret laboratory. Rudy compares Blue Beetle to Superman in Metropolis or Flash in Central City, but he says not as good. Good. I debate that. Rudy does say that Batman's a fascist. So for Rudy, it's clear he just prefers superheroes with brighter colors and who are more friendly in nature. In this lab, we see the past eras of the Blue Beetle suits from the Dan Garrett era and the Ted Cord era, though one of the mannequins is empty since Ted Cord is currently using it wherever he is. Ted Cord's gear, especially his ship, might remind viewers of the Night Owl from Watchmen. And there's a reason behind that because Night Owl and some of the Watchmen characters are based on those Charlton Comics characters that were included in that DC acquisition. And Blue Beetle was a direct inspiration for Alan Moore when he created Night Owl. We learn more about the history of the superhero Blue Beetle who had studied Kajida and the Ted Cord mysteriously disappeared, leaving Cord Industries in Victoria's hands. And the post credit scene of this movie will show a transmission from Ted Cord, screen to scramble to make out who it is, but just so we're clear, it's not Ted Lasso, Jason Sudeikis, that was debunked. Also later in that post credit scene, we see a package of Oreos. Now these were favorite snack of the Martian Manhunter, though sometimes in the comics they're called Chacos for whatever legal reasons. The director has said that these Oreos were an intentional Easter egg to imply that Ted Cord, the Martian Manhunter, had been on adventures before. Martian Manhunter appeared in the Snyder Cut of the Justice League. This could be a clue linking this movie to the Snyderverse. I don't really know. This one's much uh, brighter and lighter in tone. So Victoria's helicopter flies toward Jaime's home in the Keys and Jaime summons Kajita by realizing it won't let him die. So he jumps 
bounce off a building, a huge leap of faith, but also a leap of desperation because this raid of the Reyes home with the blinding flashlights definitely shot to evoke the traumatic raids of immigrant homes by ICE agents, especially the shots of the neighboring families peering out their windows and doors with concern. It really makes you hate Victoria Court for ordering to target the family in particular. And the fact that Alberto dies from a heart attack shows that factors like anxiety and trauma, high blood pressure, these are often unseen effects of families and communities like this, but impact the families just as harshly. So a justifiably distracted Jaime gets taken by Carapax to the Cuban island fortress, and they call this Pago Island. This is a location in the Blue Beetles comics where Dan Garrett dies and Ted Kord becomes the next Blue Beetle. Jaime gets strapped to a machine that downloads the knowledge from the Kajida to the Omax, and during this, Jaime experiences a vision from his father in this kind of spirit realm to embrace his destiny as a Blue Beetle. Jaime awakens, and Carapax's Omax suit has evolved into this more powerful form using this downloaded knowledge. But it's not just on Jaime. The whole Reyes family uses Ted Kord's bug ship and its arsenal to raid the island, and it's so great. Jaime battles Carapax, and it nearly kills him this time, but the Kajida reveals to Jaime the memories of Carapax's past as a child soldier in Guatemala and his enslavement by Victoria for this OMAC program, so Jaime spares Carapax. And we have to point out here that one of Ted's gadgets is a modified Nintendo Power Glove. This is a controller for the Nintendo Entertainment System released in 1989, but before this, its most infamous appearance was on film when it was being wielded by the video game hustling bully in The Wizard, starring Fred Savage, when the Power Glove looks like the coolest thing in the world. But anyway, this flashback with Carapax is interspersed with real news footage of U.S. military action in South America. The director said that he wanted to remind the audience that Carapax's backstory was based on real historical events. Carapax turns up Victoria and sets the Omax suit to explode to destroy the island and himself and Victoria. In the aftermath, Jenny takes over Court Industries and pledges to rebuild the Reyes home, and Jaime and Jenny finally get that smoochy smooch. So where is Ted Cord broadcasting from in the post credit sequence? Well, we made a video breaking down that scene where we theorized that he could be stuck in time with his time-traveling best bro, Boost Mr. Gold, who has already been announced as the focus for the upcoming Max series. Another theory could involve the Reach. These aliens created the Scarabs and used them to conquer worlds. They have fought the Justice League and the Lanterns on a number of occasions, and the director has said that the Reach could play a part in a future sequel. It is possible that Ted, obsessed with harnessing the power of the Scarab, ran afoul of the Reach in space and was captured. I don't know from you, what do you like the most about this Blue Beetle film, and how do you want him to come back in the DC Universe? Subscribe to all three of our channels on the New Rockstars Network. You can follow me at EA Voss. Thanks for watching, I'll see you next time, bye.